Uh, as Victor knows, um, my background um, in uh, my PhD was in uh, statistical decision theory, and I'm a mathematician by training, a mathematical statistician, I would probably define it as. And my, uh, the early part of my career was spent in the London School of Economics, uh, the University of Edinburgh, and uh, then um, Harvard Business School, a Ford Foundation visiting assistant professor. And, and then I was a, a founding associate professor in, in London Business School, where I actually set up the decision analysis unit there, uh, which had been in my mind after my PhD, but uh, my period in Harvard where I met some wonderful people, in particular Howard Rafer, who sadly died now, but uh, was one of the great uh, decision theorists of his day. And um, through interacting with them, I set up a, an applied decision theory unit in, in London Business School. It's called the Decision Analysis Unit. I got grants from industry, a number of major British corporations, insurance companies, such as uh, Prudential and, and um, Unilever uh, and a number of others um, to examine how to apply decision theory in practice. Because that's one thing I had learned in my period in Harvard, which I hadn't been taught when, you know, I was in the places doing my PhD, which included LSE, the University of Chicago and the University of Edinburgh. Uh, this was new territory. And this new territory I exploited in Britain because I was joining London Business School in Regent's Park, new buildings, new ideas. Lots of people wanted to get on. So whilst I was still teaching uh, um, decision theory and actually dis applied decision theory, decision analysis in London Business School, I was lucky to meet um, the late John Stopford, who was a professor of strategy at London Business School. And he heard me lecturing one day. He says, why don't you come over and teach a, a joint strategy course with me? Because it seems to me you were talking in part about analytical models of strategy. So, you know, being a curious soul, I went. And, and so we did a joint course. Out of that came my interest in strategic management, which, um, and, and, you know, I'd, I had spent some time in the University of Southern California and the University of British Columbia by then, as well as Harvard. And so I then was appointed a foundation professor of management in the Australian Graduate School of Management in Sydney, which was an entirely new national business school in Australia. And there again, again I was working with Phil Brown, uh, um, Gray Ball, George Foster, people I'd known in the University of Chicago, all of whom were incredibly well known in finance and accounting. And it was like a sand bath setting up, sandbox, if you like to think of it that way, setting up a new university. And I really enjoyed it, but I didn't, um, I didn't stay uh, a tremendous amount of time because I had some offers, one from Canada and one from the United States. I went to University of British Columbia, uh, Ken McCrimmon, who I had known in decision theory, was taking a sabbatical. They asked me to come and teach courses in uh, his courses in UBC while he was away. And I also um, uh, did a joint seminar that he did with Danny Kahneman. And there I got a, a tremendous interest in behavioral decision theory. So you know, this, was this was before I was really a grown man in many ways. And then I was offered a job, two jobs in the United States. I took the job in the University of Illinois to banish Champagne uh, as a full professor. And then during the time I was in Urbana Champagne, I, I had uh, years off at, back at London Business School, at MIT and the Sloan School in the policy division. And I interacted with a number of different people who had different perspectives, for example, on Aldo Hacks. And then I went from and in Kellogg, I, I knew, that, which was the other place I spent time in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, in uh, roughly, when I came back from Kellogg, um, they were looking for a new dean in Illinois. And some of my colleagues suggested that they would like me to put my name forward. I was reluctant, but I became acting dean for a period, then became a candidate, and then became a dean when I didn't really want to be a dean. 
but the condition I made when I got that deanship was that I would have at least two research assistants, you know, not fully funded, but to help me do research because I did not want to give up research. By that stage, uh, during the 1980s, I had interacted as one of the founding members of the Strategic Management Society. I interacted with people like Dan Schindel in Purdue, who was highly influential, Henry Mitzberg, whom I know is on these recordings somewhere, and other people who, who taught me a broader perspective of strategy than I'd had simply coming from an analytic tradition. So I actually did an awful lot of work uh, in the middle 1980s to the middle 1990s in particular, uh, outside of the work I'd done in, in decision theory and decision analysis, talking about subjective probability, utility, decision models, I started working on competitive strategy. And that was influenced heavily by the famous Caves and Porter paper in that field. Um, and I published a lot of articles in what are often described as A journals in the field. But after about four or five years of doing analytical work, I became convinced that that work was not uh, as thorough as it should be. And so I linked up with a, a cognitive psychologist who at the time was at Illinois, is now at NYU, and went to um, Emory on the way, Joe Porak, who, who's a very well-known cognitive psychologist. And we, we changed our perspective on uh, um, analytical perspective. Uh, competitive strategy. I learned cognitive psychology from him. And we wrote a, an article which has been heavily uh, cited, where we called uh, that we coined the word cognitive communities uh, to talk about the nature of a strategic group. And of course, that work carried on from that period onwards to an article I wrote in the Strategic Management Journal as recently as 2017 called Categories and Competition which linked my work on analytical strategy with the work on cognitive strategy, with the work on organizational strategy. Because when I moved from Illinois to Warwick Business School as Dean, I came back to an old friend of mine who's very well known in the strategy field, but particularly in the organizational behavior side of the strategy field, and that's Andrew Pettigrew. And Andrew Pettigrew, together with people like Andy van der Ven and Henry Mintzberg are, you know, the disciples if you like, of the processual view of strategy. So I learned from, from uh, Andrew uh, that kind of methodology. And when I was at Warwick, I did one or two studies, particularly on management education, particularly on European business schools, got very close. And on the way, I also, for some reason, not only uh, became, was a dean, I chaired AACSP, I also chaired GMAC, I was president of the Strategic Management Society. So somehow or other, I got uh, from some place, which I often describe as the rugby field. I think I got my capabilities at, uh, at, at uh, leading something because although I was a lousy rugby player, or pretty good, I was never, but I was very often captain. And, you know, I didn't realize that was sort of on the ground coaching for something else. At least I feel it was now. I'm sure at the time I never th conceived of it that way. So I get through Warwick Business School and, and you know, I, I've done on it, I think, a, a decent job at Warwick Business School as dean. And I'm approached to join Singapore Management University, which had only at that stage been ongoing less than 10 years. And since I've been doing an awful lot of strategy work in management education, I thought, well, let me go and have a look at it because actually I really didn't feel like I'm going to Singapore and I'll be blunt. Um, uh, we ha already had two job offers in the United States and we had a house in Florida at the time. So you can guess that um, our mind was elsewhere. But I well remember I did consulting work for the Malaysian government on management education and Singapore Management University somehow or other um, worked with me to get me to fly down one day from Malaysia to Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. And actually, I just sort of basically said, wow, this is a city at Central University, like not too few you will see in your life. 
uh, anchored two blocks away from Raffles, right at the center of Singapore's activity, not far away from the Parliament House. I just thought it was a wonderful opportunity and it was a, it was a school growing and I thought I could contribute to it. So eventually we went there and I was in Singapore, essentially um, the last um, active years of my academic career until COVID came. But, you know, basically, basically I um, have just finished a book on the evolution uh, of Singapore Management University, which is just going to the publishers right now. And I, I, I told um, Victor the, the title a moment ago, but I'll read it to you. Creating a new management university, tracking the strategy of Singapore Management University in Singapore from its uh, uh, beginnings, 1997, its establishment in 2000 to 2020, the first 20 years and a hell of a time. It, uh, it, I'm very, very proud of that book. As I in my writings, integrative writings in management education, where I did studies in North America in, with Peter LaRonge, who's in this series with, with uh, um, uh, people uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, and I was giving a talk to the African Association of Business Schools last week as their keynote speaker. I'm really fond of Africa. Africa, Latin America, uh, a book on liberal management education. And I believe, that throughout my career, I've moved away from being a mathematician to work with people who, through whom I gain insights and ideas that I was never formally trained on. But, you know, I'm still roughly smart enough to pick up the ideas and work with them. And I've always believed in the value of working with other people. That's how knowledge is integrated knowledge is generated. The sadness of the Zoom generation is I have to look at pictures, not having conversations in a room where you could debate, dialogue and argue for hours on end, uh, fortified by coffee, if you so wish, or whatever else happens to be available later on at night. Um, and I think that's the characteristic of my academic career. It may not have been the most brilliant academic career, but it's been a mix of, you know, pretty you know, if you pretty de decent, highly cited scholar, if you go and look at ResearchGate and Google citations, but also a person who, as Dean, took it as, if you like, a lesson in how to integrate knowledge, how to write it up, and to, to get faculty members to work collegially, collectively, and as a team. And I think when you talk about the complexity of business schools, you're referring to an article I wrote that emerged out of a book called The Business of Business Schools, uh, which was published in, I don't remember, 2018 maybe. Um, but, you know, I would choose to integrate that one with a book I wrote in 2020, which was called, um, uh, it was on liberal management education. I don't exactly remember the title. Arts of Management Education. And actually, what's important about that book is that I spend an awful lot of time talking about a philosophy of management education in which the liberal arts are embedded. So very clearly, and, and you know, SMU is an example of it, but not the only example. I mean, in, in Abana Champagne, when I was dean at, at uh, Illinois, the first two years was largely general studies, the specialization was the last two years. The same thing must be true in the University of North Carolina. I mean, so, but it was an amendment to that concept because there's an awful lot of, you know, strong uh, study of philosophy. And um, I, I challenge you to go and look at that book because I, I look at different models of management education and argue that man there is no model of management education that is a must have. I mean, you go back to the Gordon Howell reports, the Ford Foundation reports in the 1960s, which generated the golden age of US business schools. So there is absolutely no question. Um, the golden age of, uh, of business schools is the, is, is uh, uh, get that, that wording comes from Mioja 
and James March in a book they wrote. But, you know, from about 1960 to 1990, it was the golden age, which was which prospered on what we may call a logical positivistic model, very narrow, disciplinary oriented, got even more disciplinary oriented. And, you know, it was in bits. You did your work in, in math. You did your work mathematical methods. You did your work in organizational behavior. There was very little sensible integration. And I think this integration movement has come up largely after the global financial crisis, in my opinion, where prior to that, there was already criticism by people like Samantha Goshal and others that we were actually, you know, teaching amoral theories. And, you know, it was an argument against, if you like, shareholder capitalism. Well, what we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years is an argument for stakeholder capitalism as an alternative to shareholder capitalism. It hasn't said that one is better than the other. It's argued that these are alternatives. And what does stakeholder capitalism take in? It takes in the views of business, government, and society into, in an integrative fashion. And that's what it's attempted to do. And I think what you've seen post-COVID is an incredible outpouring. The students, after the global financial crisis, started talking more and more about social responsibility, about sustainability, about climate change, and so on. I could go on. But my book on inclusive growth, which came out very, very recently and got a, an award from, uh, you know, the RRBM community, the Responsible Research and Business and Management community, was about integrating different models. And that one does bring in complexity in a different way than I brought in complexity in terms of business schools, because I was looking at the complexity of uh, alternative models of management education then without homing in on which was the best. I mean, if you looked at a business school from 1960 to probably 2020, they were doing one thing or another. They were doing executive education or undergraduate education, executive education to pay the bills and so on and so forth. But the amount of integrative research coming out only started growing in the second half of, of that decade. 2010 20 largely prompted by people you know looking at the global financial crisis and saying whoa well we we dodged a bullet there then the other bullet came the tectonic shift of 2020 and that that certainly changed things and brought our attention to inequality in a way anybody who believes that there isn't inequality should just look at the moment at what percentage of people in Africa have had one vaccine. I've had three. I've had two initial ones and a booster jab in Britain. How, what proportion of the world's population have had three jabs? Probably 1% and they're all in wealthy countries. And that is not right. So students have talked about inequality. They've talked about social responsibility. And, and those are things that I think are the genuinely integrative topics of our generation. You know, you could talk about three sets of inputs. One set of inputs is, if you look at, look at Africa in contrast to a Western economy, um, uh, most of Africa doesn't have adequate infrastructure. For example, um, you know, I think only 600 people 600 million out of about 1.2 billion in Africa have electricity. And now, of course, solar forms of electricity may, may, may help, but one way or another, the inf one set of inputs is the infrastructure. And if the infrastructure is not right, you're not gonna get anywhere. So by infrastructure, I'm talking about those things we talk about as you know, public goods, if you like, health, education, roads, I mean, there's some crappy roads in Africa, for, for example, and, and so on and so forth. If you haven't got the building blocks of, a, of a, an economy, you're never going to work. So what goes alongside um, those other um, basic inputs? Then it's the specialized tools, the specialized knowledge, technology.
and so on. And so it's the linking of those inputs together with the inputs that come about through technology and so on and so forth. Uh, and the final set of inputs is the networks that make this thing work. I mean, the political, the social, the other networks that make societies work. If you don't have these three working together and you don't study them in a collaborative fashion, then you're not going to get the answer to these problems. That's why I was attracted to liberal models of management education. That's why I set up this model of inclusive growth, thanks to a grant from MasterCard. And out of that grant from MasterCard, I wrote a series of case studies, which have just been published about two or three weeks ago or a month ago, under the title Asia's Social Entrepreneurs. And it actually looks at how you solve problems of microfinance in Myanmar. It looks at water problems in Cambodia. It looks at what I call impact along multiple dimensions using teams of people who are trying to, you know, run across those economic, those social, so social inclusion, economic inclusion, financial inclusion is tremendously important. You know, and you know, financial literacy. The other grant we had when I was in Singapore, which still exists, is with the City Foundation. And um, one of my colleagues there, Arabondo Gosh, is still there. And he and uh, some colleagues uh, teach financial literacy programs in places like Vietnam and so on, as well as in Singapore, using students as project teams and developing knowledge about financial literacy. If you haven't got financial literacy, you're not going to link people together. So, I, you know, I'm probably rambling, which is, you know, a characteristic of my Welsh upbringing, which is, you know, the ability to talk about anything all the time. But I hope there's a consistent theme in that. The consistent theme is if you can't integrate all those inputs together and synthesize them in a fa fashion that makes sense for a given economy. And they're not all the same. I mean, the characteristic about all these economies I've been working in a, in the last 10 or 15 years, which include Latin America, as well as Africa, as well as developed economies, is the ability to understand country, culture, and, you know, I fit, you know, uh, um, Culture eats strategy for breakfast. I think that's a, a Drucker uh, quote, but country, culture, context. I mean, it would go back also. I mean, I made this argument as well um, before I wrote the book on the liberal management education. I made the argument in the book. I know Peter Laurent has been in your, your um, uh, talks. Um, but I wrote a book on the business school in the 21st century um, for Cambridge University Press probably seven or eight years ago with Peter Laurange and, and a very famous mar uh, American marketing professor, Jagdish Sheff. But in that, we made the point. You go back to Cardinal Newman um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of a an university. And he talked about a number of skills, analysis, synthesis and a critical perspective. What liberal management education does is to try and develop those, not just tools, you know, I mean, what a business school education can do, you, you know what it's like, that, you know, they describe an MBA as well. The first part is boot camp where you do finance, accounting, oh my God, what, you know, what a boring subject, you've heard it all, statistics and so on. And then they get a chance to do some other electives. What liberal management education does is it says to somebody, you don't have to make your mind now. We're going to take you through economics, philosophy, the social sciences, and, and give you the skills that enable you to frame an argument, to frame a problem. You know, simply because I teach a finance course and I give you a model which might be the capital asset pricing model, doesn't mean that's the only model that you could possibly use ever to analyze the financial situation. What you want to do is to, in the first two years of an academic experience, to, to, to open people up to 
you know, a knowledge of the civilizations in which they operate, the history of those civilizations, history, philosophy, you know, the other strong social scientists. I remember when I was in school, I was shoveled into a mathematics, physics, and chemistry stream because I was good at it. The history teacher was as boring as hell. But what you, but I, after, you know, 40 years later, I've learned, discovered how important history is. So uh, what liberal management education does is to try and say, there's a panoply of things that build up skills of interpretation, of criticism, of creativity, of analysis and of synthesis, which come from studying the ideas of philosophers, studying the ideas of alternative social scientists and doing it in a way where you're exposed to ideas. You don't know uh, at the time exactly how they're going to merge themselves together. But if you have that foundation, when you get to, you know, and we have a panoply of majors in, in SMU, I mean, we've, we've expanded them from the original ones, you know, the obvious ones, We've got sustainability major, majors, we've got experiential project-based learning majors. In fact, many entrepreneurship majors, I mean, entrepreneurship is the number one economic growth target in Africa. That's how I feel it should be.